in Egypt A fearful time had come For one little Hebrew boy Who was his father's firstborn son Now with the angel of death Passing low It was hard to fall asleep But one little lamb stood in his mind as he lay there counting sheep. He wondered why the young lamb had to die, why his blood was on the door. Through the wind and rain it still remained, but he wanted To his earthly father With a trembling voice so scared Crying, Father, will you Please look and see If the blood is still there He said, Son, now don't you worry For the blood is there to see Flood of endless questions, doubt had filled my mind. The fear that gripped my troubled soul brought me back to my knees in prayer, crying, Father, will you please look and see if the Amen, amen. Good evening, Belvoir Church. So glad you should be able to tune in to, online tonight on a Sunday evening. So thankful to have the opportunity to be here and to, to preach to you. I uh, tell you what, that's a beautiful song right there by the Spencers. The blood is always there. Aren't you so happy that no matter what goes through trials in life, it's this fading life, the blood's always still consistent. Jesus still reigns upon the throne today. Amen. We're going to be in Matthew chapter number 6 today, tonight. And um, I'll be honest, it's, it's been a sort of a rough week for me. I wouldn't say rough. It's kind of busy. I, uh, we had school, and with the snow and with all the weather that's been happening, the changes of weather, things have just been piling on with, you know, the possible cancellations and store closings. And then I got a phone call yesterday from Brother Henry, and he asked me, he said, Brother Bruce, I, I know that you've You've preached to them a few times, and I'm sure they're probably tired of you by now. But would you preach Sunday night? No, I'm just kidding. He, he, he did ask me, though, and I, I told him, of course. And so I, I started talking with the Lord, and he, uh, he gave me something that a lot of free will Baptists don't like to talk about. It's the, uh, the object of fasting here in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, 
For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you tonight. We thank you for allowing us to be here and for the message being able to be spread over the internet. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity you've given us each and every day to grow closer to you. God, we ask you to just be with the word, be with me as I give the word out, Lord. Not let it be me out of a selfish heart, but let it be you that flows through me, Lord. We ask this all in your name. Amen. I, I will say that the, the Sermon on the Mount is probably one of the most influential passages in the Bible. It's, it takes from Matthew 5 to Matthew chapter 7. And it, just, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but it's a whole lot of truth that Jesus likes to put in all at once. And at this point, Jesus has already talked about different type of teachings. He's talked about anger. If you have anger in your heart towards somebody and you hate them, you murder them. He teaches on temptation. He says, whoever looketh on a woman with lust has, already adult, has been an adulteress. He's talked about divorce already. He's talked about having an oath. He's talked about forgiving one another. And he's talked about loving your enemies. He's talked about giving. He's talked about prayer. And at this point, he's talking about fasting. Now, a lot of people tend to overlook this couple of verses. But the truth of the fact is, fasting is one of the most important things as a Christian we can do today. You say, what exactly does fasting mean? This word is basically you're taking a break from something. More often than not, when people say they're fasting, they're fasting with food. But that's not always the case. You can fast from social media, you can fast from television, you can fast from things that aren't going to bring you closer to God. And in that point, you're going to spend that time and you're going to pray to God. You're going you're to ask God in a special moment right then and there, the time that you would normally do something else, you're going to spend that time praying to God. And tonight I just want to talk to you just a few truths about what fasting is, why we need to fast, and a challenge to fast. First off, what does fasting do? Point number one, when we fast, we will not make a show about it. Fasting is something that we need to do as a Christian because it's been talked about throughout the Bible. You don't believe me, you, you can go through and you can look at all the different Bible characters. Daniel fasted, David fasted, Moses fasted. Jesus fasted. Paul fasted. These people fasted. Why? Because God commanded them to. God said that if you seek my face, to seek my face, how can you seek God's face if you're so focused on something else? That's the point of fasting. Those who, those who would fast in, in this time, though, that Jesus is talking about, most of the time they were like the, the Pharisees. They would walk around, oh, I'm fasting. I'm fasting so I can pray to God. And they're walking to everybody. I'm fasting, I'm fasting. They have that sad countenance to them. And that's not the kind of way that we need to have. We need to make sure that when we have that spirit of fasting, we're able to, to just talk with us and the Lord. We're not trying to be hypocrites. We're not trying to go out and show people. Jesus talks about it with prayer. He says there's people that stand in the public square and they pray. And they pray to God and they say, God, look at me, I'm so good. God, you know, look at me, I'm, I'm fasting. God... I need your help. I'm, I'm fasting right now. And they're, and they're doing this. They have their reward. The reward's going to come in earthly value. People are going to look at them and be like, oh, they're, they're fasting. But the Bible's very clear. We don't need to be doing that. Why? Because if we do that, we're just going to seek worldly pleasure. And as the message was, was preached this morning, it was a great message. It was talking about just the things of the world. We cannot be of the world. We can't act for these worldly pleasures. Paul says that sin profited for a season. It's not going to do you good for a long time. If we seek for the things of the world, we're not going to want to seek God. So Jesus is very clear. He says, I say unto you, they have the reward, but when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. When you're fasting, you, you want to be clean. You want to be clean unto God. It's the same thing when it comes to communion. A lot of times you hear the story of Jesus at the Last Supper, we read through it in 1 Corinthians. But when we fast, we need to come to, to the Lord with a clean spirit. You need, to, you need to ask for forgiveness. If you've done something wrong to somebody else, you need to come to him with forgiveness. You need to be clean. 
You need to anoint thy head and wash thy face. You need to make sure that you yourself are a clean person. When we do that, it just then becomes between us and God. And that's exactly what God wants. The whole point of fasting is you're pulling away from the world. You're pulling away. You're saying, I'm getting rid of all of this. God, it's me and you. And then you can look straight upon God and you can ask upon these things. Why? Because when we fast, things are going to change. You look at, you look at the story of Esther. Esther, in the beginning couple chapters, she becomes the, the queen. She is a Jew. She becomes a queen because the, the original queen had, had decided not to go to the king when he called upon her. So the king said, I want to find someone else. He found Esther. He liked Esther. He said, Esther's the, the one for me. And so Esther became queen. And then when Mordecai, her cousin, was saying, Esther, I'm going to die. My people are going to die. He says, you, you've got to do something. You've, you've got to change this. And he, he says in, in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So Esther's response in that is, is a great biblical example of what we need to do. Esther chapter 4 and verse 16, Esther says, Go, gather together all the Jews, all that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish." You say, okay, she fasted, but how did things change? We continue on. Let's go to chapter number five. We'll start in verse eight. It says, it, Esther says, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and it pleased the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Then went Haman, forth a day joyful with a glad heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him. He was full of indignation against Mordecai. At this point, because she fasted, she was able to go unto the king. The king allowed her to come and didn't kill her, and now she's able to have a chance. Let's read on. Chapter number 7, in verse number 2, it says, And the king said again unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed, even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther, the queen, answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we have been sold for bondmen and, and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. At this point, Esther's clearly saying to the king, King, you, you've got to understand my people are dying. So she's fasted, and she's, she's clinging to God, and the people are calling on to God still because of the fast. We're going to continue on. I'm going to show you exactly how it works. If you look at verse 9 in the same chapter, Harbenel, one of the chambermen, said before the king, Behold, also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. The king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman and the gallows which he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Through the spirit of fasting that Esther had, through the spirit that she had to try to save her people, that she called upon her God, she was then able to see God work in her life. Through the spirit of fasting she had, she was able to see exactly how God was going to be able to save her people. You could say, okay, that's, that's one way, but, you know, is there another way? Yeah, of course. We'll go to the book of Jonah. I understand that's a big book, all four chapters of it. But it's filled with so much, so much truth, and you can look at exactly how America should be. But that's, a, that's another subject for another day. But we'll, we'll start through Jonah. Jonah was commanded to go to Nineveh. In, cha in cha chapter 1, verse 2, Lord says to Nineveh, go, or Lord said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. You say, okay, so what did he do? Obviously, Jonah being the man of God that he was, fled, because that's exactly what we're supposed to do. He fled away from God, and then God corrected him. 
So Jonah eventually goes over and he prays and he goes and he tells Nineveh, Nineveh, you need to repent. So in Jonah chapter 3 verse 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For would came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Fasting works, folks. You don't believe me, look at Nineveh. Nineveh was saved. Nineveh was, was destined to be destroyed. God clearly says that he was going to destroy Nineveh. And then because they fasted and they cried out to God, God saved them. You tell, if you look at this, you cannot honestly say that fasting doesn't work. But most importantly, when we fast, God's going to be willing to show his plan. We, we, we all want to hear what God's plan is on our life. That's something that a lot, of, a lot of Christians just think, oh, if I just pray to God, God's going to show me his will. Like it's just one big document that we have to follow. I'll be honest with you, that's not how it works. God's not going to show you everything you need to know in one day. God's going to show you a little bit. Now, you may know what you need to be doing five years from now, but do you know what you're going to be doing next week? That's not how God's plan works, but we need to fast. Second Chronicles chapter 7 it says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and will heal their land. You say that that doesn't say anything about fasting. In order for you to humble yourself, you need to take away things that you don't need in life. That's exactly what fasting does. Fasting is going to humble us. Fasting is going to be able to, to tell us what we need to do. When we fast, we need to take something out of our life that's not good for us. I'm not saying it's bad for us, but we need to take something that's not going to glorify God. A lot of time it's food. Why? Because especially here in America, we're so focused on food. We have to have three meals a day, two snacks. And most people, myself included, I have a snack before I go to bed. We don't have to do that. Jesus went 40 days without food. Why do, why do we do it? That's just an American ideal. And that's one, of the, that's one of the main things about fasting. Not that it's bad for us. Why? Because if you, if you were to try to continue to live without food or water, you're going to die. But it's something that we can live a couple days without. We can spend that time praying to God. You want to you see a change in America, first off, it starts with a prayer. You want to see Christians stand up and do something for God, it always starts with prayer. We, have, we use the term prayer warriors. Who are they? Those are people who are going to focus strictly on praying to God and asking him to strengthen other people because they can't do it themselves. That's exactly what fasting is going to do. When we call for a national day of prayer, that's a day that we need, to, we need to set aside and we need to focus strictly on God. And I challenge you that if you've never fasted before, whether it be from social media, if that's something that you, you do a lot of, or if it's TV, or if, or if it's food, or whether it, no matter what it is, I say unto you, take a fast, just take a day. And if, you know, a lot, of, a lot of phones, the iPhone especially, has this little thing called screen time. And you can pull it up, and you can look, you can say, oh, I spent two hours and 14 minutes on Facebook today. And you take that two hours and 14 minutes, and you stay off of Facebook, and you grab the Word of God, and you start praying, I'm going to tell you something, your life's going to change right then and there. Even if you just do it once a week. Or if you, if you take a couple days, and you say, for, for lunch this, this entire week, I'm not going to eat lunch. I'm going to spend that 30 minutes that I would normally eat lunch. One, you're going to save the money because you're not going to be spending it on food. But two, you're going to be taking that time. You're going to take that 30 minutes and you're going to sit down. You're going to open up God's word and you're going to pray. You're going to find a promise that God has in his word and you're going to pray on it. If you want to see true spiritual change in your life and other people's lives, that's exactly what needs to be done. And I understand it's not an easy thing to do. But when it comes down to it, fasting is one of the most important things we need to do. And I challenge you tonight that if you don't fast, you, you, you learn how to fast. You use this example that Jesus has taught us to fast. You say, how has he done it? Verse 18, that thou appear not unto men to fast, 
but unto thy Father which is in secret. You're not going out, you're not telling people, you know, you, if, you're, if you're addicted to, to Facebook, if you spend time and you're going to fast from Facebook, don't make a big old post, I'm not going to be on Facebook this week because I'm fasting. You want to take that, you want to talk to, to God. It's between you and God what you do. Jesus says, talk unto him, which see, the Father's going to see in secret and reward thee openly. That's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. And of course, you know, we, we don't talk a whole lot about this in the Free Will Baptist denomination. Why? Because most of us aren't smaller people. We enjoy to eat, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm telling you right now, if you want to see a true spiritual change in your life, fast. I challenge you just to take one day this week. Just take one day and say, I'm, I'm getting rid of this. And you, you write it out. You, you take a sheet of paper and you write, Lord, I give up and write it out. I give up food today. I give up my phone today. I give up television today. I give up writing out whatever I want to do. Lord, I, I give out whatever. It doesn't matter. But you say, Lord, I'm going to take that time and I'm going to give it to you. And you just see exactly how God's going to work. You start doing that on a consistent basis, you're going to grow leaps and bounds. And that's what the Christian walk's going to, going to help you the most with, by growing leaps and bounds. So I challenge you tonight, take one day this week, fast, pray. Pray that God will use you in a, in a special way. Use this time to, to pray for our country. Pray that you can somehow make a change somewhere for the cause of Christ. You may not be able to, to go make a, a huge impact somewhere to a lot of people, but you can make a big impact on one person. Take that time fast. Pray. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word and for what you've done for us, God. Lord, we thank you for the promises that you've filled this book with. All promises that are complete truth. You've never failed us and you won't fail us. Lord, we're so thankful for you. We ask that you just be with us this week. Lord, help us to fast. Help us to find something that we can grow closer to you. And help us find somebody that we can witness to, Lord. And we'll ask this all in your name. Amen. Y'all have a good night.